everybody. It's Alice Ginsberg checking in with another travel log. And um, for this uh, trip, I want to show you where we will be going. We are going uh, to uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and we will start in Istanbul, sometimes known as Constantinople. So Istanbul is here where my cursor is. And this was a cruise. And we come down from Constantinople and we go to a place called Ephesus. Ephesus uh, in biblical times was a port city and uh, it was a thriving metropolis with Greek and Roman um, overtones. It's also uh, a spot visited by Paul in the New Testament. You might know about Paul's letter, letter to the Ephesians. These were the people of Ephesus. From Ephesus, we're going to go to Santorini, an island in the Aegean that belongs to Greece. And then we are going to go to Athens, Greece. And from Athens, around to a place called Olympia or Caracolum for some more Greek ruins and then up to Corfu, this island here uh, in the Ionian Sea, very close to the Greek mainland. It's, uh, it's also uh, known for several things uh, among others. This is where uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh was born. From Corfu, we are going to go up to Montenegro here on the Adriatic Sea. Fascinating place. Very small place, however. And from Montenegro, we're going to go over to Ancona, which is where the ship docked in order to go to the university town of Urbino. Urbino also has a marvelous ducal palace. And we will wind up in Venice where we will visit um, everything in Venice from St. Mark's Cathedral to the Jewish ghetto. So that is our wrap for today. And I am going to compress this map so that I can scroll through my pictures. Now, I will tell you, I have been to Istanbul twice. And my first pictures from Istanbul are actually pictures of pictures that I took in 2009 before I had my digital camera. Uh, and I will show you these pictures first because it was in 2009 that I visited uh, the Blue Mosque and Hagia Sophia and uh, the uh, Istanbul Bazaar, the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, which is quite a trip in and of itself. It's very easy to get lost in the Grand Bazaar, even for guides. So, let's see if I can get us to scroll here. Here we go. We are going to wake up in Istanbul, but it is evening. And this is a picture from 2009. It's a picture of a minaret from the Blue Mosque in the uh, old section of Istanbul. And you can see the moonrise here. This little dot here is the moon, which is what led us to actually take this lighted picture of the minaret. I know this is blurry, but Bathed in lights like this is what the Blue Mosque looks like at night. Here is the carpeting in the Blue Mosque. The Blue Mosque is located in uh, a very um, well-known part of Istanbul. 
Uh, it's very close to the cistern entrance. It's very close to Hagia Sophia. Um, it is not close to the Top Copy Museum, but um, it's in the Sultanhan district of Istanbul. Istanbul, as you know, traverses both Asia and Europe. We spent all of our time on the European side in both trips, but there's also a very vibrant Jewish community on the Asian side. And there is a district on the European side, which used to be a, Ju a Jewish district. There is a synagogue there uh, that has a, um, a Torah table in the center of the synagogue. Uh, it's a Sephardic synagogue and the Torah table platform is uh, reminiscent of Noah's Ark, and there are painted uh, sculptures of animals all around the Torah table. Unfortunately, I do not have a picture of that today. I am sorry. Here, though, you have the ceiling in the Blue Mosque, which, as you can see, is quite an ornate affair. It gives you an idea of the size of the pillars and the size of the Blue Mosque. And this is a uh, fresco in Hagia Sophia. Uh, you see the Virgin Mary and Jesus with um, Constantine holding a model of the city and Saint, uh, I think it's Saint Peter here. On, on the left. And this is in the ceiling of Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia originally was a Greek Orthodox church that was commissioned by Constantine in the 300s AD. And it was built of wood and it burned and it was rebuilt and the second one burned. But then they rebuilt it again as a, a Greek Orthodox church once again. and uh, it was in existence uh, for centuries before the Ottomans took over uh, Turkey, and then it became a Muslim mosque. It's been in the news recently because since um, the 1930s, when Ataturk uh, made Turkey independent, and unified it and created the first Turkish government. Since then, it's been a museum. But a few weeks ago, Erdogan, the leader, uh, the premier in Turkey today, uh, reverted Hagia Sophia to a full operating mosque. And they're concerned, uh, artists and historians are concerned because uh, these sorts of images are not permitted in the Muslim religion. In fact, uh, when it was a mosque in the 1500s, several of the mosaics were plastered over. These were saved, and you could see them when Hagia Sophia was a museum. But now they're worried that since it's reverted to a mosque, that all of the uh, frescoes and mosaics will actually be destroyed. What happens uh, from Muslim times, you see this, it looks like a huge shield with Arabic writing on it, and over here to the left, that is what they used to cover the uh, Christian symbols in Hagia Sophia. And finally, this is the, again, the inside, the windows in Hagia Sophia are magnificent. Look at the vivid blue color. And from the Grand Bazaar, uh, in 2009, when we went, it was close to Christmas time. So in the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, you have a gift shop full of gifts and confectionaries and Santa Claus with his saxophone. a spice shop in the Grand Bazaar. The Grand Bazaar, you need a map to go through it. 
you can buy everything from spices to luggage to clothing to gifts to religious trinkets to rugs to uh, you name it you can find it in the grand bazaar here is a nut shop in the grand bazaar full of all different kinds of nuts And here's a view of the Bosporus from our 2012 hotel roof. Most of the uh, finer hotels in Istanbul serve their breakfast on the roof so that you can have this wonderful view of the Bosporus. In the background here, you can see the bridge, which uh, connects the Asian side with the European side of Istanbul. We're at a different mosque. This is Suleiman's mosque. Suleiman uh, was uh, a ruler in what we now know as Turkey. He was ruler of the Ottoman world in around the, I think it was the 16 or 17 hundreds. It's the side garden. All sorts of marble monuments. The front of Suleiman's mosque. This is the largest mosque in Istanbul. This is where you take off your shoes and you store them, where these people are, and then you enter the mosque. Uh, Muslims will also uh, wash their feet down below here, uh, below this pillar here. You can see these, these Muslims here are washing their feet. There are faucets there. the inside of Suleiman's mosque. This is the view outside of Suleiman's mosque. Uh, it, it's on a hill overlooking the rest of, you know, Istanbul here and the Bosporus. Gives you a sense of the massive size of this building. We are now in the Textile Museum, which is in the Sultanhan district of uh, Istanbul very close to the Blue Mosque and Hagia Sophia. And what I'm about to show you are uh, textiles that are centuries old. Isn't that amazing? This would have been a uh, receptacle where uh, they would uh, burn uh, either candles for light or uh, incense to create a sweet smelling room, that sort of thing. And this is the Blue Mosque. Uh, which is, uh, again, very close to the Textile Museum. We saw the inside before. We saw it lit up at night. But this is the famous Blue Mosque with its blue dome. And in the foreground, we have what's called the Egyptian Obelisk, which uh, has um, inscriptions and sculpture on it from uh, the campaign against Egypt.
a sultan's tomb. I'm sorry, a caliph's tomb. This would have been, this is the tomb of a religious person. And I took this picture to show you of this tree, which is centuries and centuries old, probably was here uh, on the grounds um, when the Blue Mosque and Hagia Sophia were built. I thought this was absolutely hysterical. The archeological museum is under restoration. Um, think about that statement, it's pretty funny. And here we are in the archeological museum. This is uh, myself and our guide who was actually a PhD in um, architecture and history. He's showing me uh, a tomb that was heavily, heavily carved, as you can see. And the carving tells stories of battles and um, ascensions to heaven. This would have been Greek because it cannot be Muslim because it has so many depictions of people and animals. There's part of the battle scene. Look at the detail on that. I believe this is Alexander the Great's tomb. These are uh, photos of rugs that I actually bought in Istanbul. This is known as a palace rug. It's an antique. Uh, I asked the salesperson, I questioned whether the bright blue would fade from exposure to sun. And his comment was, ma'am, this rug is over a hundred years old. I think it's done, it's fading. From Istanbul, we go to Ephesus and we are going to see primarily Roman ruins in Ephesus, uh, although there were some Greek ones as well. Remember, Ephesus dates back to before Jesus' time. This is one of the arenas in Ephesus. We've been, uh, I have been to Ephesus twice. The first time in 2009, it was a very rainy, after, cloudy afternoon and very gray. And we had a lovely day in 2012, but it was also extremely crowded. Here you see the Turkish countryside. Uh, as a backdrop for some of the ruins of Ephesus. This is the oldest known um, piece of sculpture that has been dug out of this archeological dig at Ephesus. You can see it's pretty magnificent. And here we have a, a Greek inscription. And a Roman mosaic. Ephesus was uh, quite the merchant town. It was a uh, hub 
of a lot of trade in the Mediterranean. This would have been a major stop between uh, Rome or Venice and Haifa or um, oh, uh, Jaffa. the doorway from a home in Ephesus, or part of a doorway. Uh, this was the public toilet, as though you couldn't tell. It must have been pretty hot and pretty cold, depending on the season. A zodiac carved into the stone in Ephesus. And this is the picture that most people who go to Ephesus take. This is the library at Ephesus. You can imagine what a wonderfully stately, elegant building this was in its time. It was also quite large. Here you have the Roman inscription at the top. Notice the reference to Mithridates, the um, mythical god. But you can also see the name Agrippa, which was a Roman uh, tribune and emperor. And here is the earliest uh, artistic piece that we know of in today's world, uh, evidencing Jewish culture. See the menorah carved into the stone at Ephesus. It has been walled off by glass and um, steel. They, they have it encased here in order to preserve it so that people will not step on it. But it is the oldest known um, artistic rendering of Jewish culture. This would have come from the time of the Second Temple. More of the library at Ephesus. This would have been a major street through the city of Ephesus, probably going out to what we would call the suburbs. It's another arena that they found in Ephesus. It is absolutely huge. You can see the people at the very bottom of the picture gives you a sense of scale. There were two layers of seats. The lower ones were the higher priced seats. The upper ones were for the common people. And here we are. We have left Ephesus for Santorini. And this is a view of Santorini from a hilltop. The water is really that blue, and it is the Aegean Sea, and you can see several towns on Santorini, farmland, uh, and uh, there are grazing lands as well on the island for their sheep and livestock. A very uh, common sight on Santorini, every time you see a blue domed a building that is a Greek Orthodox chapel, 
but in this particular picture, you also see a Roman Catholic um, carillon from a Roman Catholic church. So you have the two of them in close proximity. This gives you some idea of uh, the wealthier homes on Santorini, on the sea, high on the cliffs above the sea, with a view and ornate tiles or rugs on their patios. And you get some sense of the uh, steepness of the hillside. This is from one of the restaurants. And this is uh, a Greek Orthodox church in Santorini. I love this, slow food. A great shot of the chapel with the sea beyond. And here we are on the slopes of Santorini. Gives you a sense of how people live and how most of the buildings are white to reflect the sun so it doesn't get quite so hot on the inside. Uh, how some of them might be pink or yellow, but always very close to a chapel. I love this replica. So a photo of our cruise ship uh, and it was anchored out and we were, um, uh, you know, taken in by, um, uh, you know, smaller craft. But this is our cruise ship here in the harbor at Santorini. It was the Seven Seas Mariner. Over here is a restaurant. You can see all the people sitting down here to the left. And this is a, a photo I took as we were leaving Santorini. This is the Windstar. She is uh, uh, mechanically powered, but she has mechanical sails as well. And she goes under sail as much as possible. Isn't she a beauty? You could take a cruise aboard the Windstar. We are in Athens, Greece. This picture reflects the Acropolis ruins and the modern city beyond. Going up to the Parthenon. taken from the Parthenon, and we are looking down at Athena's temple. I have a few views of the Parthenon, and uh, this is the famous temple with the uh, uh, women sculptures as pillars. There they are again, better view. Closer up. These date back to before Jesus time, of course. This is the Parthenon. You'll remember that the frieze from the Parthenon was uh, taken by the British for the British Museum. So we do not have a frieze. We have gone from Athens to uh, Katakolon, or otherwise known as Olympia. These are more Greek ruins. This is where the first Olympics were held 
This is also where Phidias, the famous Greek sculptor, had his studio. And Phidias, as you know, uh, carved many of the sculptures for the Acropolis. He had a mini Parthenon here. You can see the ruins here. This is Phidias's studio. They have been able to carbon date it and figure out that this was his actual studio. It's the entrance to Phidias's studio looking up. You have to actually, to get into it, you have to step up and then step down. I am standing on the Olympic finish line. I have finished my race. That is the first Olympic finish line in history. That is the entrance by which athletes would enter the stadium at the first Olympic stadium. more ruins from Olympia. They would actually uh, have pedestals and uh, they would have the losers stand on pedestals in all manner of weather as uh, a, um, oh, to show that they were not good athletes, uh, that they uh, had not distinguished themselves. It was sort of like a punishment. And yes, there was Starbucks coffee available in the neighborhood. Here we are on our way to Corfu. This is the uh, governor's palace at Corfu. Uh, this was also the palace of Prince Philip's parents. Uh, they uh, were uh, king and queen of Greece. Um, they had come from Scandinavia. The Greeks had overthrown their monarchy and brought in Philip's parents. Um, but uh, this was pre-World War II. And um, when, the, um, uh, when the Germans were uh, uh, converging on Greece, uh, Philip's parents fled to uh, Europe, to the interior of Europe. And he was born here, but he was actually uh, brought up first, I believe, in a remote part of Germany, and then he was sent off to English boarding school. This is uh, the museum on Corfu, and I thought this was very interesting. They were having an exhibit of China and Greece, and they were contrasting the civilizations. Here are some street scenes from Corfu. You can get marvelous handmade Greek embroidery here and clothing um, and lace. It's really very a very picturesque, pretty part of the world. There is also a very famous monastery on Corfu. We were lucky enough to visit it. It's up in the mountains above the sea. This is a view from the monastery. Look how clear that water is.
the monastery bells. And mosaics, Greek mosaics. The loaves and the fishes. Peacocks. And here we have a cat who is very serene. He is in the eaves of the uh, church building for the monastery. Here's a photo of the, the flowers and the greenery and the herbal garden at this monastery were absolutely spectacular. We are in the church of uh, the chapel, I guess you'd call, of the monastery. This is the ceiling. And the altarpiece, check that out. And this is a pathway to a monk's cell within the monastery grounds. They have some very old medieval uh, books that have been, uh, that were copied by the monks who inhabited here back in the Middle Ages. This is a photo of an example of their work. We have left Corfu and we are on our way to Montenegro. The sea is quite narrow here. During World War II, they uh, erected a chain again across the uh, waterway so they could regulate ships going in and out. This is the town of Kotor. You can see it's just nestled between the sea and the mountains. It's a church, actually another monastery. Uh, it was a convent and, and um, it is, uh, I'm sorry, it started out as a monastery and it is now a convent in Montenegro, just offshore of Qatar. It's its own separate island. Here you can see where they had thrown the chain. It's a church on a different island. There are two islands here. One is for the convent, which is also a bird sanctuary. And uh, this is a church. Here we have the inside. It's amazing to me that here you are in a church where the emphasis is on light and you have something here that almost looks like a ner tamid. And you have an altar and behind the altar, you have a um, place where a Torah might have been kept. But no, this is really a church. This is the ceiling from this church. Churches are very much uh, about being edifices to the glory of God, whereas synagogues emphasize a sense of place more than um, a sense of building to God's glory. It's a depiction of the Last Supper, although it's not, of course, Leonardo da Vinci's idea, but uh, 
this is where uh, Jesus supposedly would have said, one of you will betray me. Heavily carved, even on the pillars that lead up to the organ, you can see uh, the uh, depictions of uh, sea battles and um, nature. This, is, this particular pillar speaks of the sea, and you can see all these different ships and chariots. It's an old mantelpiece in Kotor, and uh, it is one of the oldest uh, things that have been uh, dug from some of the ruins underneath the city. But you can see here the crossed keys, which is the symbol of St. Peter. Another view of the convent cum bird sanctuary. This picture was taken from the church. Here we are coming back to KOTOR. This building here, this white building is a museum. The walls of Dubrovnik. The King's Crest. And here you can see the communist symbol that was erected at the entrance to the old city. And you can see it was 1944, November 21st, 1944. Views of the church. Look at those pillars, very solid. Baptismal font. Papal robes. You get a sense here of how steep the hillside is. This is an older church up here, up above, clinging to the hillside. It's an old castle. You can see the castle walls and, and the old enclave that was up here on the steep hillside. Very steep, very rocky, uh, mostly limestone, a lot of caves up here. 
We are in a cemetery in Kotor. And this was an absolutely fascinating place, symbolizing prayer and God's love. Look at the, uh, here we have the crusader, the knight in his armor is in the sculpture. And this is very, very uh, typical of the graves. Uh, this is a fairly new grave. You can see 2010, 2000. This was uh, erected in 2000 for the, fa for the husband and uh, the wife died 10 years later, but what, what you see is um, flowers, of course, there are religious insignia on these graves, but then uh, the religious insignia are overtaken by communist insignia. And you, you look at the inscriptions on these graves and they tell a whole story of um, conflict and regime upon regime uh, that took place during the lifetime of these people. There are some Jewish people buried here. Here you have a, a Christian grave and here you have some Hebrew. So you have a Jewish grave. It's all mixed up here and it's all overlain by a communist uh, blanket. It's very interesting. And you can see you are only 150 meters from the Croatian-Montenegro border. Montenegro is a very narrow, very small country. So I think the walls I showed you earlier were the walls of Kotor. This is the wall in Dubrovnik. You can see the Croatian flag here flying from the walls. I apologize. Dubrovnik, it was a very cloudy, rainy day. Moby Dick, it's a cafe. This is a typical street in Dubrovnik, upstairs all the way. And here we are in the Jewish street. Church in Dubrovnik. I love this window. Look at the painting. This is a painting of old Dubrovnik. Inside a church, the organ, a lot of gold gilt here. Baptismal font. This is Saint Stephen. He was uh, a knight. He is the patron saint of Dubrovnik, I think. This is the inside of the synagogue in Dubrovnik. You can see the kaporet for the Aron Kodesh, the Ner Tamid. It's from the synagogue in Dubrovnik. From World War II. The people who did not survive. You 
you can see the depiction of Rachel's tomb up here in this memorial. Some proclamations which were issued to preserve the synagogue in Dubrovnik. And these were rescued from the synagogue and buried uh, in World War II to preserve them. The old Torah. This Torah dates back, I believe they said to the 1300s. And you can see it. I'm not sure, you would think it would be Sephardic, but it looks more Ashkenazic to me, the way it is rolled. They had a huge map of Israel in the synagogue. Sunset over Dubrovnik. And we are in Urbino. This is a university town. It was uh, a seat of higher learning um, from before the Renaissance. The apothecary's shop. A pension for the university. This was uh, for female, this is like a female dormitory. And Kona, which is the port city for Urbino, is uh, just south of Venice. The public fountain in the square of Urbino. And the Ducal Palace. We were not allowed to take pictures inside the Ducal Palace. I had to buy a book showing the exquisite parquet floors and walls and uh, all of the detail and tapestries. It was just a magnificent uh, edifice. It was built, okay, this is a theater, Teatro Sancio, which is part of the Ducal Palace. The Duke built this palace for his bride. This is the entrance to his library. This, um, and it was a separate uh, building off to the side, but yet connected to the palace. And all around the top here, you can see the inscription uh, that he wrote to his bride. This is his bride's name was Claudia and his name was Federico. the ceiling in the library. It was the only interior we were allowed to photograph. It's the ducal emblem. Fireplace in the library. And on the top of uh, the library, you have St. Peter and the Virgin Mary. Here we have a, uh, a cardinal from the Catholic Church. This is the uh, landscape uh, that I photographed from uh, a square in Urbino. It's a good picture. It gives you a sense of the Ducal Palace and how large it is and how magnificent. And I took this picture to show the modern crane, the modern construction crane, and the Roman arch. What a contrast. Anyone know what this is? This is the Canal Judaica in Venice because it goes to the Jewish ghetto. Your quintessential view of Venice. You have 
St. Mark's Cathedral here, you have uh, all the shops and homes here along the waterway. San Giorgio's Church. St. Mark's Cathedral. The Duomo, the tower, the uh, Ducal Tower. And this was the Doge's Palace here. Venice was a world power in its time, as you all know. This pillar in the center, there's one pillar, there's another one here, you can barely see it against the building. This was the entrance to the city of Venice. Here you can see it much, much better. You have the Doge's Palace, you have the library, you have the entrance to the city of Venice with St. Mark's Square and the cathedral over here in the background. And the bell tower, of course, here. You can see Marco Polo's original maps in the library in this building to the left. Uh, San Giorgio's Church, as I mentioned before. Wouldn't you like to have this yacht? This is a private yacht we saw in Venice. Here we are on the island of Murano, known of course for its glass blowing. We had a glass blowing demonstration put on for us. And this is a plate that I purchased. These are glass beads that have been fused together. No one plate is the same. It's all done by hand. It's what it looks like when the light is shining through it. It was uh, the uh, forge of Faro Lazzarini. The gas or the glass works of Ferro Lazzarini. Here we are in St. Mark's Square, and you can see it is dry. In the afternoons, it is quite dry. This is St. Mark's. Here's your quintessential view of the canals with our gondolier. This is what St. Mark's looks like in the morning at high tide. There are walk, wooden walkways and you are provided with boots because the city is of course sinking. You can see the mosaics of St. Mark's here. Recently, this area of Venice uh, sustained incredible damage. Uh, these pictures, were taken of uh, parts of St. Mark's that are probably now lost. This is the Doge's Palace over here to the extreme right. So you get an idea of what St. Mark's is like. 
Most people in Venice go around, when they have left their homes in the morning, they're wearing knee-high boots and they keep them for, uh, throughout the day. It's a, uh, a tomb inside the walls of St. Mark's. Atlas with the world on his shoulders. Hercules. And the ceiling of St. Mark's Cathedral. They were celebrating a mass while we were there. These are the prophets lined in the ceiling here. This is a shop window in Venice. Venice is loaded with shops. They sell all manner of masks. And this is the direction to the Jewish ghetto. There were three synagogues here, uh, one Ashkenazic and two Sephardic in these buildings. And the ghetto was built on the site of a foundry. So there's a large uh, courtyard kind of plaza surrounded by buildings. And that, that's what remains of the Jewish ghetto of Venice. It is uh, a ways away from St. Mark's. Um, it, it's quite a ways away. You would have to take a couple of water taxis and then, as we did, uh, get lost trying to uh, find your way from one part of town to the other. But getting lost in Venice is kind of fun. Um, the street signs are coded east, west, north, and south. And eventually, even though some of the canals all look the same, you can find your way out. But back to the Jewish ghetto, as I said, three synagogues were here in these buildings. The oldest one is in this wooden building right here up above. The, uh, the Jewish ghetto dates back to medieval times. Here we have a plaque to Maestro um, Della Casita, Adolfo Atalenghi. Was erected, as you can see, in 1947. There are several plaques around the square to people who perished in the Holocaust. So this is a plaque, a sculpture, a Holocaust memorial that is uh, on the walls of the courtyard in the Jewish ghetto. You could see the railroad boxcars and the people coming off the boxcars and the Nazi guards and so on here. And we have here uh, the only kosher residence in Venice, 14 modern and comfortable rooms. It's known as the kosher house. It's a bed and breakfast and you can book uh, a room here, I believe, and stay in the Jewish ghetto. Here is another plaque to Giuseppe Jonah. He was an illustrious uh, doctor 
in the Jewish ghetto. Here you get a sense of all the different Holocaust memorial plaques that are on the walls of the courtyard. And the sunset over Venice. And there you have it, uh, our cruise from Istanbul to Venice. I bid you good day and thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. For more videos, please visit www.cje.net forward slash cyberclub. <laughs>